In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is the second creation story in the Bible. The first occurs in chapter 1, and you may wish to read that for yourself. It tells of how God made the world in six days, simply by speaking it into being. Each day God proclaimed that what God had made was good, until he got to the sixth day when he made human beings, which he declared to be very good, and on the seventh day God rested. This second story of creation, which we heard a part of today, exists alongside the first story in order to answer the question which has bothered human beings since the beginning of time. The question of why it is that God made the world and it was all good and even very good. And God was pleased. And when humanity was the very pinnacle of God's creation, why is it then that the world we live in can be pretty rubbish, actually, to put it politely. Why is it that God made the world wonderful, but there are forest fires burning across Western United States? Why is it that we have a virus which is killing people and which has changed our lives into something which we would never have imagined six months ago? Why is it that people who have left their homes with nothing and are living in refugee camps have their camp burned down? Why is it that people suffer from illnesses like cancer or fibromyalgia or multiple sclerosis or dementia? Why do little children go hungry? The questions are endless. And they apply especially when it comes to natural disaster and to innocent victims when there really is no one to blame, we think, except for God. How could God allow such things to happen? That's a question that lots of people ask and have been asking for eternity. It's a reason why some people choose to not believe in God, because they can't believe in a God who would allow such things to happen. Well, I think that the author of Genesis chapter 2 and 3 sets out to offer an explanation as to why the world is the way that it is. It tells us of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden at the very beginning. Each of us, though, is Adam and Eve. We are all made by God. God breathes life into each of us. When we're newborns, we are innocent, just as Adam and Eve were innocent. We don't realise that we're naked and we don't know the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil. But when we grow up, there comes at some point the realisation of these things and it doesn't take very long. We realise that we can choose how we behave because, and this is because God created us with a free will. We can obey God or not. We can do the right thing or not, just like Adam and Eve. It's in the choosing to disobey. It's in the giving in to temptation that the perfect world that God made becomes imperfect. When Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, there were terrible consequences. They were thrown out of the garden, separated from God. But not only them, the whole of creation began to suffer because of their choice and because of the choices of those who have come after them, including ourselves. As Paul put it in his letter to the Romans, all of creation groans until the present day. As people just like Adam and Eve, we make the same choices as they did. We choose to disobey God. Often and regularly we do that. We do what is best for us and not what God commands. Our actions have repercussions. There is shame, there is fear, there is blame, as there is in the story of Adam and Eve. These are all part 
of the fallen world in which we live. In many ways, the environmental crisis that we are facing now actually shows us more clearly than ever that the sin we commit, the poor choices we make, affect more than just ourselves, more than just our own families, our neighbours, but the whole of creation. It seems that there is no happy ending to this story. When I tell the story of Adam and Eve to children in primary school, they are quite disappointed by the end. They understand that it's a sad story. And they're right. Adam and Eve had everything they could have ever wished for. They had such great communion with God. He walked in the garden with them and talked with them. But after they sinned, they were banished from the garden into a world of animosity and pain and hardship. The truth of, that this story tells us is that the world is in the state it is because of the sin of humankind. And that is almost too much to bear. It's beyond our power to make things right. Where can we go to find hope in this story? This is where we turn to the whole sweep of the Bible narrative. Because from this point on, God works towards bringing us back to himself. And the pinnacle of that story comes in Jesus Christ whose death and resurrection turns us onto a new trajectory towards God instead of away from him. And then as we get to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, we find the promise that one day creation itself will be restored. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Paul in his letter to the Romans also says that Creation will be set free from its bondage to decay. Creation will be brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We are saved, but creation is also saved through the work of Jesus Christ. So the reason the world in which we live is often quite terrible is not because God willed it to be that way, but because we as human beings have turned against God and towards our selfish desires. The poor choices we make are what causes the whole of creation to suffer. And we can do little to make amends for this. What can we do then? We can turn back to God. We can do that through Jesus Christ. We can repent for the things we have done that are wrong and for our attitudes towards creation and we can seek to value it and care for the environment in which we live we can always place our hope in the God who is with us now who walks with us and talks with us and we can believe that one day the world will be made perfect again through God's grace and power to his name be all the praise and the glory forever. Amen.